Shalom, my friends. This is chapter 9 in our Neshama Soul series, and perhaps one of the most relevant of all in a practical way. What we are going to be discussing is the fact that it's a mitzvah to bury your loved ones, and it's an absolute Aveda transgression to, God forbid, cremate a loved one. And this includes, even if this is their expressed last wishes on their deathbed, or even if they leave it in their will, that they want to be cremated, God forbid, we mustn't halachically obey them or listen to them. In fact, we say it is something that they were not aware of, how tragic such a thing is for their soul. And in the soul state, they are begging us not to listen to them. They're begging us for their own good to to do what the Torah says. It is sometimes people don't know the ramifications of what they are saying or what they are doing. If a person finds medicine bitter, and says it's not helping them, I'd rather have something sweet, and a doctor says, this is what you need, then you should listen to the doctor, not to the patient. Even though it's the patient themselves, they don't necessarily know what's best for them. And so too, when we're talking about the body and soul, a person does not know necessarily what is best for them. The Torah, the spiritual doctor, tells us the best thing we can do for a loved one is bury them. And now I'll go through certain aspects of the importance of burial and why it is so evil to, God forbid, cremate someone. The first thing is that there is a biblical law that says in Bereshis, in Genesis, at man's creation, may offer basa el offer toshuv. From dust did the body come, to dust it should return. And that is a mitzvah to bury the person in the ground. The Torah also in Deuteronomy, in chapter 21, says, Ki kabor tikberenu bayoimahu. Bury shall you surely bury the person on that day. In fact, it is a mitzvah to bury a person as soon as possible. We try and bury them the same day unless it is for the covered mess, for the respect of the dead, that we take the time. But the Torah definitely commands us that once the soul leaves the body, the body should be buried. To do anything else would be demonstrating a rejection of God's supreme ownership over all creations. And he is the one that could command us what to do. Also, we should appreciate that Judaism has perhaps a different look on the human being. The human being here, we don't belong to ourselves. To give you another example, Torah forbids suicide. Why? There's a very general question. Who do our lives belong to? Whose life is it anyway? In some concepts, they say our life belongs to us, and therefore we could do what we want with it. However, Tara says no. Our life belongs to God Almighty, and he owns our body and soul, and therefore we're not allowed to take our lives, God forbid, through suicide. Perhaps it can be compared to a car. There's a difference between a car ownership and a car unleasing a car. 
If I go to Hertz, today it's bankrupt, but if I go to Hertz and lease a car, I'm not happy with it. I don't have a right to dump it over a cliff. I would have to discuss it with the owner. Similarly, our lives don't belong to us. They were leased to us to live out its time. As And so too, our body was leased to God. We don't have a right to burn it, to cremate it after death. If we return it in a wholesome state as possible by burying it into the ground. To do anything else would also be a rejection of the Jewish belief. As the Torah says, B'Tselem Elohim bara. God created us in the image of God. There are many different Kabbalistic explanations to what that means. But one of the points is that it is God Almighty, where our body is created in God Almighty's image. And therefore, to do anything else but burying it would be a opposition, a rejection of that Jewish belief. One of the Jewish beliefs, in fact, the 13th principle of belief, after the 12th one, the 12th one is a belief in Mashiach, and the 13th that the Rambam outlines is that after Mashiach comes, there's going to be a tchias hamesim. There is going to be a revival of the dead. The only time that revival of the dead can take place is if we bury the body. If, God forbid, you cremate the body, then you cannot have a revival. It can be compared to planting. If I take peas or any pips and I plant them into the ground, they will grow. But not if I cook those peas first. If I cook them or burn them, and then plant them, nothing will happen. So there is a natural process that comes when you bury pips, when you bury peas, that it grows up. And so too, our holy teachings tell us that when you plant the body in the ground, then it'll come up for the revival, the resurrection of the dead. If you first, God forbid, burn, cremate the body, then it cannot come up but that all, by the way, is when we are doing this voluntarily. If, God forbid, you uh, it, it happened to someone, for example, sadly, the Kedoshim, the holy, our holy martyrs during the Second World War, that after the death camps, their bodies were put into crematoriums. Those were not by done by their will. That goes into a different category, as we will discuss through a story at the end of this recording of a life story, a, a, a true story that happened with someone in Auschwitz. But what we are talking about here now is the voluntarily... Uh, doing something to the uh, body. And if we cremate them, our sages tell us they will not be coming up in the resurrection together with all our people. For that matter, we don't even say Kaddish for a person who has been cremated rather than buried or sit Shiva for them. That's how severe it is, because it is very difficult for their souls to reach any type of elevation if their bodies, God forbid, have been cremated. Kaddish and Shiva, by the way, you should ask a halachic rabbi, it might be able to be done because of the respect and the honor for the mourners 
but not for the person who you are supposed to be saying Kaddish for. In addition to that, anything but burial in the ground it's violating a biblical prohibition of following heathen practices. I want to point out that it is very old-fashioned to cremate. This was done centuries before Judaism even started, that they would, in those days, cremate people. Torah told us that this is the heathen practices. Loiselchu bechukas agoyim were not allowed to follow the other nations' practices, and to bury is the proper Jewish way. You know, the Rebbe also teaches us that there is a natural separation between the soul and the body. I discussed in the last chapter, chapter 8, the seven stages that the neshama goes through on the way from this world to the next world. And those seven stages are take from 30 days before death, the moment of death, till past the 12 months. And the soul needs the body in existence for those to go through. There's a certain natural separation and acclimation process which the soul goes through. And that is all prevented, God forbid, by cremation and causing additional pain to the soul. And not only that, but when you bury a person a certain part of the soul, there's five parts to the soul, the lowest called nefesh, is connected to the physical realm through the grave site, through the body. And if you cremate, you're destroying that connection come completely. And it also deviates from the Jewish history and from all our forebearers and Claudius Thrall who went through selfless and heroic efforts to properly bury our dead. We all know stories of, of people who, who do tremendous sacrifices to make sure a person comes to a proper burial. To tell you one personal story, my Zayde, Rab Shimshin Kalbach, who lived in Lübeck, Germany, was taken by the Nazis together with his wife, brother, and other families onto a train from Germany to the concentration camps. My Zayde had a heart attack in the Riga station. He was together with his brother, Rabbi Yosef Tzvi Kalbach Hashem Yinkaim Domoy, in, who was the chief rabbi of Altona, Hamburg, and Wandsbeck. And he <coughs> saw that Maizeda passed away. He made sure that Maizeda had a proper funeral in Riga, a Jewish funeral. He wasn't, not many were privileged to have that. In fact, my great uncle himself was murdered in the concentration camp and has no burial. So we have made tremendous sacrifices. Not only that. Do you know a Kohen? He's not allowed to become ritually impure to made to a dead body. Uh, nevertheless, if he comes across a dead body, it becomes a mess mitzvah. It's a mitzvah to bury. And he himself even though he's a Kohen, would have to involve himself with the burial. That is how serious we take it. And in addition to that, do you know when we call, talk about a, a, a body which was the seat of a soul, it can be compared to a Sefer Torah. 
Every person can be compared to a Sefer Torah. Can you imagine a Sefer Torah, even if it became possible and can't be used anymore? What do we do with it? We bury it. Do you know anybody who would, God forbid, treat a Torah with the disgrace of burning it? And so a body should be no less. We should certainly bury it. And it is when you cremate, what you are declaring in effect is that once the spirit has departed the body, the lifeless uh, body has no further value. But that is not true. That remains a connection, as I said, that is a planting, and that is a growth for Trias HaMesim. Furthermore, do you know what a burial does? It leaves a permanent place. It gives future generations a place to visit, a place to feel your presence. It is a chain. It is a co continuity. I had the privilege a few years ago of visiting Lubeck. And there, the Karlebach family were rabbis. In fact, my great-grandfather, Rabbi Shlomo Karlebach, who passed away in 1919, was the rabbi in the Lubeck shul. He lived on top of it. In fact, if you visit the shul, you'll still see pictures of him. And I was privileged to go pray at his gravesite, where he's buried together with my great-grandmother, uh, Rebetzin Esther. And there was a certain feeling of pride, of being a part of the family, of knowing where I come from. There's a link in the chain. I went to Prague. I saw the cemetery there with the grave sites of the Maral of Prague, the creator of the Golem. You go around all the Tzionim, all the different places in, in Russia, in Ukraine. People visit their grandparents, their great-grandparents, and it makes it more meaningful. We read in the Torah that Kalev went to the grave of the patriarchs in the Ma'ara Samach Pela, Avram, Yitzchok, and Yaakov to say prayers there. Till today, how many people go to the Ohel of the Lubavitcher Rebbe where they feel his presence and say their prayers and so many miracles come from that place because they are buried there. All the prayers going to the tomb of Rachel, the cave of Rachel, one of the most meaningful, beautiful places to go say prayers to. You go to the Rajbi in Miron on Lagba Omer. You say prayers at his gravesite, and people could feel their presence which still remains. That is only possible when you bury someone, not, God forbid, if you cremate, you are destroying the whole tree, that whole link of past, present, and future isn't there. We want a place where we can show our grandchildren who we come from. How many people visit the cemetery and find such meaning in going to the grave sites of their loved ones. It is the greatest thing that you can do. And you know, even scientifically, it would tell you that burial is a different process, God forbid, to cremation. Because a burial can be undone. You know, they can take out a body that's been lying there for, for decades and perhaps centuries and still find the DNA and still do a process with that, because it's still connected to the individual that was. We can get DNAs from our parents that are buried, but not, God forbid, from ashes in an urn or a cremation. So, really, we have to make sure 
to bury our loved ones. Cremation, I hate to say bad things, but you know where cremation was. It was in Auschwitz. It was in Bergen-Belsen. It was in Madanik. It was in the concentration camps where the Nazis cremated the Jews. That should never be done for our loved ones. And speaking about that, as I said, more towards the end of the tape, I'll tell you a story of what happens to those, sadly, who went to the crematoria. How can we be sure that they will arise for Trias Amesim, for the revival of the dead? I heard this story from a Rabbi Nissen Mangel. He is the translator of the Chabad Siddur, Thank God he is still alive and well in New York. And he came for a visit to Johannesburg. And he told us that when he was still before Bar Mitzvah, he was taken from Czechoslovakia in 1944 uh, to, to Auschwitz. He was a very strong, broad young man who looked much older than his age. When he appeared before Dr. Joseph Mengele and Mengele asked him, how old are you? And he was told that he better say he's at least 18 if he wants to survive. He said 18. And Mengele took a look at him and he said, even though I know you're much younger, you can go to the right. And that saved his life. There was a time that he spent at the crematoria. Do you have any idea how hot those crematoriums were? There should be nothing that survives. And yet, coming out with the ashes were these little bones. And he tells that those little bones are what the Talmud, the Gemara, speaks about. It is called the Luz bone that gets fed by the um, Malava Malka. But this Luz bone is indestructible. It, no fire, nothing can destroy it. And he saw these little bones. And the Talmud says that it is from this bone that God will rebuild the person when it comes to Trias Amesim. So if anybody, God forbid, goes through a fire or anything in, a, in an involuntary way, God will do a double kind of miracle, so to say, to resurrect them. But that is only true when, when um, that is only true when the person is not cremated voluntarily. So a burial can be undone. You can't do that with, with a, a cremation. And I wanna, don't want to be too blechy, but another point is, you know, when you come to a burial, you know for sure that it is your loved one in the coffin that is being buried. But when it comes to crematoria, they are very busy. They tell stories, who knows which person is there. No one could see what they're doing. They might just give you ashes because they're busy and they'll do your loved one another time and at someone else's completely. I've been told stories where people buy expensive coffins and they take them and just bury them in pieces of cardboard. At least with a funeral, you are actually being seen what is being done. Now, some of the reasons, especially overseas, that they give for cremation is financial reasons, that a cremation is much cheaper than a funeral, and they can't afford a funeral. Thank God in South Africa does, that doesn't happen. We have an unbelievable Heva Kedisha, and this Heva Kedisha buries everybody regardless of financial stature or anything like that. When a 
person passes away, it could be there's no pauper's grave here. Every Jew is treated equally. And even if there are no finances, the Hever will make sure that they get a proper burial. Overseas, you also have organizations that would help with a burial. Contact your local Chabad or your local rabbi to get help. But don't ever put your loved one through that aspect, God forbid, of not having a funeral. We should appreciate that this is the Jewish way. This is the only way. And as I say, your loved one is begging you to bury it. You know, thank God we are living in a time which is the threshold just before Mashiach comes. Then we will see the coming of the redemption and the 13th principle, the resurrection of the dead. Our loved ones are praying to us. Make sure we give them a, few, a proper funeral for the sake of the past, the present, the future, so that all together we can come to that resurrection, to the revival. And they will thank you for doing, for bearing them as they should properly. I bless everyone with a long, wholesome, meaningful life. And for the sake of your loved ones, for the sake of everybody, of the Jewish people, and what we have always been through, when the final time comes, make sure that they get a Jewish kosher burial. God bless you.